Welcome to the Futurist Society podcast, where we delve into the latest advancements in technology, science, and culture. From discussions on the latest breakthroughs in AI, biotechnology, and space exploration, the Futurist Society is your window into all of the awesomeness that the future holds. Get ready to be informed and inspired as we consider the positive impact of emerging technologies on humanity. Without further ado, welcome your host, Dr. Awesome. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Awesome from the Futurist Society. We are talking today with Brian Sullivan, who is a leader in social connectedness and healthcare technology as it applies to that. Brian is a doctorate in psychology and is also a practicing therapist. So I want to introduce Brian. And Brian, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing with gauging people's social status and how they feel. Uh, not social status from a uh, hierarchical perspective, but just how they feel on a regular basis and how we can use that information to help us in the future. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'm a clinical psychologist and uh, I'm approaching my 30th year of practice now. One of the principal things that I've learned is how lonely so many people feel. Uh, Previous Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, wrote a book a couple of years ago, I think maybe last year, called Together, and he really nailed it. He called out what he referred to as an epidemic of loneliness in the United States, and I fully agree. I don't have the breadth of experience or, or reach that he has, but I see it in my practice every day. I saw it amongst my students as a professor. I see it amongst my friends and colleagues how disconnected people feel at the most basic level, not having the experience of being really seen, heard, understood, and deeply connected with other people. And that is not only sad, it's also ironic, of course, right? Because we live in a telecommunications age that has unprecedented capacity to allow us to connect with other people, to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, to really relate with one another. And yet so often just the opposite of is happening. We have uh, <clears throat> perhaps can count dozens or hundreds of friends on various social media platforms, but are we really connecting with them and spending time with them the way that we need to? And when I say need to, I mean at the physiological level. I mean, we are social animals. We are evolved animals that are built for social connections and we are grossly lacking in the quality of that social connectedness with one another. And there are all sorts of negative downstream health effects of being disconnected from others in the same way that there are downstream physiological negative effects of having too little sunshine, of spending too little time outdoors and getting sunshine, a vitamin D that is produced and the serotonin that is produced and fresh air as opposed to living in boxes with air conditioning going constantly. Yeah, so let's just focus on the social component, component for just a second. The hard evidence is that we're seeing other human beings less. Is that correct? Yes. So just give us some statistics that people can come away from this and just understand the scope of the problem. Mm -hmm. I, what, from my basic understanding is that I know that we have uh, a decrease in the amount of close friendships, but also just the amount of time that we spend with people outside of our immediate family. Is that correct? 100%. Now, I don't know statistics very well off the top of my head. Uh, if I could keep track of those things, I probably would have been a biostatistician instead. But what I can tell you is that uh, looking at different sources, you know, young people are spending anywhere between five and nine hours a day on electronic devices. They're often communicating with one another asynchronously. That's, that's uh, per perhaps an upside, but the downside is that they aren't physically with those other young people. And the same applies to varying degrees to adults as well. We are spending more and more time at work, more and more time commuting, more and more time on telecommunications, uh, the irony of the moment, the present moment notwithstanding. And we are spending less time actually face-to-face, -face, in contact, able to touch, able to smell one another, 
you know, something that came out during the pandemic was uh, what's referred to as touch hunger. Lots of people not realizing that they were more stressed because they were experiencing an absence of the buffering effect of actually being touched by other people. We are social animals. We are engineered, if you will, to respond to connectedness with other with other people, including actually being touched, shaking hands, hugging one another, holding hands. Um, so a lot of folks were complaining about feeling touch starved. And unfortunately, we don't see that abating very much at all. So touch aside, because I feel like touch is definitely something I want to come back to, uh, because I do know the fundamentals of it. The famous experiment where the monkey baby was raised by a uh, thorny mother substitute versus something that was a soft mother substitute. David so, Harlow, David Harlow and his monk, his racist monkeys. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So so the Harlow experiment, I think, is something that I'm familiar with. Uh, so I understand the value of touch, but is the amount of touch something that needs to be replicated because to be quite honest with you i feel like there are a number of social uh substitutes like zoom for example how we're talking right now which i feel like maybe it doesn't do the job but i would probably have had more face-to-face -face interactions now through zoom than i did in the past uh you know granted like when I was younger, I might have had like a face to face interaction where we would be playing video games together. And that was a fun experience for us. But now I can play virtually with my family. And it, I feel like it's it's not the same, but it's still very fun. And I still get a lot of value out of it. So whether we like it or not, society is trending in this direction. Is that still something that we can uh, gain the same kind of benefit from, or is this something that is just, we need to work on more face-to-face -face interactions, period? So it is good to be connected with others, whether that's by telephone, whether that's by writing letters, whether that's by telepresence, like we're doing at the moment. There are great benefits to that, of course, yes. And that's much better than being simply isolated, as we know so many people are. The difficulty is this, so much of that time spent online is transactional in nature, uh, commercial products being sold and discussions around that, ordering things and dealing with customer service. It's also instrumental in basis, uh, just trying to get things done as in work meetings. And it is entertainment based. And of course, I'm not dinking entertainment. I love a good video game. I, I love to spend time playing Wordle with my friends. And, and too little of that time is spent actually checking in with one another. How are you doing? What's going on in your life? How can I support you? That is being neglected. Mm. So, okay. I, I hear what you're saying. Like that, that conversation that you would have with someone about uh, how they're talking, feeling, how they're experiencing what their life's going on at that point in time. But the, are those interactions, if I were to just focus on those, like let's say if I had dedicated time to just calling my sisters and saying, hey, how are you doing? What's going on with your life? How are you really feeling? Is the, is the depth the issue? Like if I get more depth out of those uh, non-face-to-face -face interactions, will that make up for the face-to-face -face interactions? I don't know whether the evidence supports that it can fully compensate. Again, it is a lot better than being isolated, and it's a lot better than not being asked. It's a lot better than not asking those questions. Here's the difficulty. Uh, unfortunately, so often when we are asked those questions, we are so accustomed to shallow level interactions, and we are so accustomed to trying to keep up a good face that we often don't answer those questions honestly. We don't answer them at length. And even if we try, so often what we hear from people in response is, oh, well, you know, don't let that get you down. Or don't you think that maybe that's not so bad? I mean, gosh, it could be a lot worse. 
or and, and here's what so often folks tell me they hear when they try to talk with their friends and family is they say, you know, I'm not doing so well. And they begin to describe that. And what they hear in response is, huh, you think you've had a bad day? Let me tell you about mine. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly now the conversation has been commandeered for the other person's benefit. And a, a problem is that we are reluctant to really fully disclose and be vulnerable. And we are ill-trained and ill-prepared to truly listen to one another. And that gets exacerbated. As near as I can tell, as far as I know, that gets exacerbated by electronic and telecommunications platforms because we arrive at those with an expectancy set of the interaction to be transactional, to be entertainment, to be uh, shallow in some way. Mm. It's difficult to let ourselves be vulnerable when we are not directly in contact with someone else. It is difficult for us to truly listen to one another mm -hmm. when we're sitting at a device and a medium that by and large has been used for very different purposes most of the time. Yeah. So, you know, I feel like what you're advocating for is more therapy sessions for everyone, you know, like, on, which is not a bad thing. Honestly, I, I feel like everybody needs a therapist. You know, I, I have a therapist myself and, it's nice to have that time where I can just have all the walls come down. I can talk about how I really feel. Yeah. Uh, but on the same token, um, I think that we should be looking to have more of those interactions with our, you know, significant others, with our friends, with our family. So 100%. how do you, 100%. how does technology have a component in increasing the amount of those interactions? So, uh, let me be clear. I'm not advocating for more therapy sessions. Mm -hmm. I tell my patients, I tell my students, I tell my supervisees, I tell everybody else all the time. My job is to work myself out of a job. And that is true on an individual basis with couples that I serve, with families I consult to. Um, I'm trying to help them to the point that I then become superfluous and I can get out of the way. And maybe two years later, they can't remember my name, but they still remember all the gains that they got from it. I actually asked most of my patients at some point or another, why are you and I sitting here together? Why are you not telling this to your wife? Why are you not telling this to your brother? Why are you not telling this to your best friend? And so often, what I hear is the same sorts of things that I was talking about a moment ago, the reactions they get are in many ways invalidating. Uh, folks are trying to be helpful by stepping in and saying, oh, well, you know, let's go shopping or, you know, don't let it get you down or maybe you just need to uh, take a walk or maybe you just need to work less. The responses that they get are not necessarily very helpful. And, and that speaks to that ill preparedness that folks so often have to <laughs> truly listen and to simply say, I hear you, I get it. That sounds awful. Tell me more. Tell me more about that. And because they don't often get the responses that they're looking for, then they become more reluctant to reach out. Interestingly, one of the corollaries to this whole discussion is the topic of chatbots. I've become very intrigued by the potential of chatbots, not as a substitute for people, not as a substitute for psychotherapy, if that's what's truly indicated. Um, what I'm actually advocating for is two prompt. One, spend time with people who care about you and be honest about what you're looking for. I really could use an opportunity just to talk. I don't need advice. I don't need you to try to make it any better. I just need to be able to talk about this. Is that okay? Can I just talk about this? Being clear about what we're looking for requires us to understand that what's really helpful often is just the opportunity to talk about it, just the opportunity to be seen and heard and embraced, at least metaphorically, by someone who says, okay, yeah, I'm here for you. Please go ahead. Tell me more. What, so what else about that? So what else is on your mind? And just being in that in, uh, curious stance, that non-judgmental listening stance. So the irony is the second prompt because that can be very difficult to find, because we live in a day and age where that may not be the sort of response that you can expect, even from people who love you intensely. 
Uh, interestingly, I believe that chatbots can play a role there, and and it can be uh, multi, multiple uh, multiple level in the effectiveness. So let me talk about that. So right now, uh, we are working up a concept and prototype for a chatbot that is trained, in essence, to act like a therapist, but not to instruct people on breathing techniques or instructing them on cognitive behavioral techniques to alter the way they're thinking. No, much more basically, a chatbot that says, hi, I am here to listen. And my principal goal is to understand how you feel. So please tell me how your day is going. Let's play the high-low game. Tell me about the high part, point of your day. Now tell me about the low point of your day. And the chatbot is listening for feelings. And here's one of the neat tricks that a chatbot can do. Because there are benefits in helping people to label their feelings, there's research indicating that when people can label their feelings, the positive feelings can be enhanced and the negative feeling intensities can be diminished. So you win on both sides of the equation. You move from, I feel awful, to I feel stressed, to I feel worried about finances. I feel worried about my children's future. I feel concerned. I feel uh, stressed about something in particular. And then to get even more granular, emotional granularity is the term. I feel tense in my body. My shoulders are tense. My head hurts. I'm having difficulty sleeping because I'm ruminating about these things. I can't get them out of my head. Then I'm irritable all the next day. And I wind up saying something abrasive to someone else. And now I've created a problem there as well because I shouldn't have snapped that. I shouldn't have snapped at that person. Now I need to go and try to fix that. And I'm feeling guilty about that. And there just aren't, aren't enough hours in the day. A chatbot can help people to label their feelings as part of their experiences, connect that to their needs and desires on the one hand and their fears and concerns on the other hand, and understand that important triad between what we feel, what we want or need, and what we're afraid of. The needs and the fears often are two sides of the same coin, interestingly, and help them increase the granularity, the specificity of the language that they use to describe their experiences. That alone, labeling feelings and helping people increase their emotional granularity, the specificity of the language that they use, those can have beneficial effects. And so we're ginning up to explore those hypotheses with an iteration of a, a very friendly, compassionate, and curious, inquisitive, non-defensive chatbot. Uh, based, by the way, on the principles promulgated by a famous psychologist, Carl Rogers, many, many years ago, uh, and Rogers' teachings about being curious, about being empathetic, responding to how people feel and communicating. I hear that you feel stressed. I hear that you feel worried. I see that this situation is concerning you greatly. Yeah. Those basic sorts of things can be embodied in a chatbot that is available 24-7, tireless, of course, not prone certain. to have bad days. Not to, not to cut you off. That's certainly a, an interesting theory, and I hope to see the results from that. Um, but is there any hard evidence for chatbots making people's lives better, making people yes. less lonely? Yes. There are a variety of them out there uh, operating presently, and they've actually been in, uh, around for several years. and. Uh, I won't mention any of them by specific name. I don't have any affiliations with any of them, so I don't benefit from mentioning them or uh, or or not mentioning them. But you can Google search. Uh, it just seems on. so impersonal to me. No, no disrespect, but like it, it, you know, me texting a chatbot, like uh, you know, listen, I'm feeling down today. I, I mean, at least when I talk with a therapist with a telepresence mm -hmm. I, like I can pick up on you know their their facial structure mm -hmm. um you know the they can pick up on my emotion mm -hmm. uh like minute to minute um structure so i think eventually when we incorporate visual analysis into it i think that that would be something that would be interesting mm -hmm. but I, like i i've tried the the therapist that you text um 
you know, I, 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 there's a number of proprietary ones, so I won't, I don't even remember the one that I did, but it was so, it, it was literally so forgettable that I don't really like, you know, <laughs> well, a, that's, been, that's been my experience as well. Yeah. I, I'm very pleased to see people making the effort. And I have tried no, no less than 10 or 12 different chatbots that are out there for this purpose. And with all due respect to those clinicians and those developers and those entrepreneurs, none of them has really done the trick for me. Now, they cite their own research or others' research that demonstrates that for some people, those chatbots can actually be remarkably or at least measurably effective. And let's face it. For a lot of folks, that is better than nothing. There are a lot of people who will never darken a shrink's door. There are a lot of people who experience so much social anxiety, they will not reach out to or even respond to someone when they try to reach out. And interestingly enough, they will talk to a disembodied medium. And there's research indicating that folks are often more honest and will take uh, will respond more fully in questionnaires, whether those are on paper and pencil yeah. or electronic format. And so there are ways to leverage those effects. And it is not a panacea. It's not a magic bullet. It's not something that should work for everyone. But because chatbots are so scalable and because they are so accessible yeah. and because they can be so affordable, let's face it, too much of mental health, too much of medicine is insufficiently accessible, it's insufficiently available, it's insufficiently affordable. And so as something rather than nothing, and as something that may prompt some people to actually be more self-disclosing, more honest, and to engage more fully, it is an avenue that we have to explore. And it is- yeah. I, don't disagree. I don't disagree with that. This is an avenue that we need to explore. I just don't think it excites me the way that it should. I mean, when I think about the future, I think of uh, me speaking with some sort of, you know, artificial intelligence that uh, has a, a presence um, that mimics human interaction. And yes. I think that the idea of human interaction via text is something that's out there. I think if you add some sort of voice component, it would increase yes. the ability immensely. Yes. I think that if you could add a body component, like if I had a robot butler that I could talk to, if I had a robot butler, period, I think that would be great. I'm still waiting for the future promised by the 1950s World Fair. Yes, me too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I will not disagree with you. I, there, there may be various uh, variables like a physical embodiment, mm -hmm. like a facial or an avatar, uh, voice interactivity. Those are all variables that are all rife for exploration as to which of those components adds measurably and significantly to the experience for people. And so wouldn't it be interesting if we find out that eventually there are some people for whom all those components have to be present. And there are some other people for whom all but the physical embodiment is sufficient and others who really just prefer the asynchronous texting because they don't want the pressure of being in a real time interaction that's for some reason that may be overwhelming for them and they don't want the chatbot to say are you still there they find that annoying and off-putting and they say no thank you and that would be even worse if there was a physical embodiment that they were staring at and they felt like was staring back at them so many variables for us to explore now for what works best for which people in which circumstances and yeah it is that uh, experience of I've tried some of these things and I just didn't feel like it worked for me. There may be that some people for whom this is never going to be a very good solution and that's okay. For a lot of other people, I think that one of the major difficulties is the technology itself, the underlying capacity of the technology has not caught up with the potential for what could be experienced for the user. Now, as AI is really beginning to come to the fore and conversational AI for, uh, in, in particular is getting so much more capable and so much more realistic in the user experience. I think we're now on the cusp of the vision now being supported by what the technology can actually provide. Yeah, so I think that there's 
uh, the idea of how we feel uh, out there that we're trying to uh, make better. But I think that if we focus on just one particular way of how we feel, like loneliness, that's something that has measurable outcomes with different therapies. And one of the therapies that has been around for a long time is, you know, fake pets that people have, and that decreases the amount of loneliness that uh, older um, individuals will experience. Pets in general is also something that's been determined to make our lives better. For example, the people who are dog owners have an extended lifespan in comparison to people who are not dog owners. Mm -hmm. But on the same token, the idea of just loneliness specifically, uh, in Japan, they gave these elders a seal stuffed animal that mimicked emotions. Yes. And yes. Just taking care of that yes. made them feel better. Yes. So we know that that exists as a technology without the chat component. Yes. I would be interested to know what the the difference would be when you actually have a chat component. And not only the difference, but like both of them together, mm -hmm. I feel like that's going to be a very different society, right? Yes. We yes. Start getting into the idea of our interactions with inanimate objects being as real or better than the actions with other human beings. And 100%. So that's, that's something that like everybody talks about in all science fiction, right? It's something that is out there. Everybody understands it. We haven't gotten there quite as a technology perspective from a technology perspective, but it's something that's there in our consciousness as a species. Yes. I think that even since, since olden times, people have had really significant relationships with inanim inanimate objects, you know, mm -hmm. the, the Greek um, and Roman myths about somebody falling in love with a statue or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's out there. We understand it. It's in our biology. How do you feel like that compares the software component versus the hardware component? You know, what do you, what, when it comes to effectiveness, do you have any insight into that? I don't have a lot of data. Uh, I am aware of the little seal robots. And now we're talking about robots themselves. Uh, and I believe that's been around for at least 10 or 12 years. And that is truly intriguing, of course, right? First of all, it's soft and fuzzy. It isn't a lizard. It's a mammal. Why? Because we are more responsive to things that are more like us, by and large. There are exceptions. Yeah. I have friends with reptiles who would beg to differ, right? But, yeah, but also the Harlow experiment, like you alluded to, the idea of something soft versus something that's not tactilely as, as uh, approachable. Exactly. Yes. So the contact comfort, the seal is very interesting, of course, because it doesn't talk, uh, but it wiggles and it I, does something sim similar to purring. Uh, it makes a contentedness sort of sound when you stroke it and when you take good care of it, those sorts of things. We see this with children, of course, all the time. They embody inanimate objects with life constantly. Right. And they interact with those objects as if they are vivid and real and responsive. And that's that imaginative capacity. Now we're going over into the domain referred to as affective science and affective computing, which is uh, underpinning the robotics. Uh, so, again, that's another variable. Is there a physical embodiment? Then we may refer to it as a robot. What sort of physical embodiment is going to be uh, most engaging? and produce the most beneficial effects, or at least support the beneficial effects, perhaps indirectly, uh, for, for some people versus others. I can personally point to a couple of kids who would tell you, yeah, if I'm going to have a robot, it needs to be a bearded dragon. And other kids who'd say, no, it needs to be a teddy bear. Well, no, it needs to be a cat. And I think the mammal component or uh, contingent would outweigh the lizard con contingent, but that that doesn't mean the lizard's contingent. It doesn't exist. And it doesn't mean that they would be content and happy and say, oh, OK, well, a mammal's fine. No, they would really rather have a bearded dragon or at least some uh, some semblance thereof. Our wonderful capacity to project 
vividness and aliveness into other objects is endlessly fascinating. I remember studying many years ago uh, in which someone programmed a computer chess game to cheat. Mm -hmm. It would take a turn out of turn. It would move a piece when it wasn't its turn and people would be upset. And here's the interesting thing. When the, as I recall, when the computer program was simply a computer chess program and that's all it was referred to, people saw that out of turn move as a glitch. When that computer chess program was given a name like Mike and people were told, this is Mike and Mike is going to play chess with you. When the computer chess game took a turn out of turn, people got angry. Mike is cheating. They embodied it and said, hey, it is a gentic. It is doing something. It's not making a mistake. It's doing something willfully. And that's the sort of uh, basic background research in affect computing that fascinates me with respect to how do we use technologies? How do we embody technology? What sort of interactive media components are going to work best for which people in which circumstances? If the target is to reduce loneliness, then okay, then we're solving for N, we're solving for loneliness, which variables for which people are going to work best. If we're solving for something else, like teaching people to relax, then a different set of variables may work better for different people. So in regards to the idea of social relationships with uh, inanimate objects, I think that that's something that will be of benefit to society. I think that some sort of social experience is going to improve the development of an animal or a human being in the same way that fertilizer makes a plant grow better. So I, I, I look forward to the day when my daughter has uh, a very profound relationship with a robotic pal or buddy that you could update and that gives her the amount of affection that she needs to make sure that she has the most excellent development that is available to her. Is there any information out there from the psychology literature about just like objective measures of how that sort of, those sort of interactions affect us? Like, do we have any sort of hard objective data about that? Mm -hmm. There may very well be nothing that I am aware of or can think of right offhand. What I can tell you is there are collections of people who are meeting regularly to explore the pros and cons of what you just described, because so many people are expressing the concern. Uh, what if we train our kids to expect to get all of their needs met from technologies, what could be the deleterious effects of that? So you just said, you know, she has a, a, an intense relationship and a satisfying relationship with a robot that meets all of her affective needs. That probably isn't going to happen because she isn't a robot and because she has a physiology that still needs to hear actual voices and to experience actual touch. So how can we bridge that? Well, there's a lot of different ways we could go about that. One of those is to make sure that we are keeping the technology's aims in the direction of helping to improve people's ability to relate to other people. So it is a facilitative device to help people get better at seeing and understanding other people and letting themselves be seen and understood by other people. And of course, discerning between safe people and not safe people. Um, I think we'll lose if we expect the technology to meet all of those needs. It can be a great supplement, especially for people for whom access and affordability and availability are obstacles or even barriers. Yeah, I but think for those of us who aren't facing those obstacles and we can use these things at will. And uh, if if the technology helps me to be a better person so that I'm a better father for my daughter, then everybody gets to win. I think that's where I look at it. I look at it as a supplement in the same way that I take protein powder to make sure my muscles get bigger, because if I work out and I don't have enough protein that's available to me, then my muscles stay at a certain level, right? And I feel like 
our development can be delayed by having a lack of those soft supplements, right? Like, like a, a tender voice talking to you when you're crying, you know, somebody that's listening to you. Those are the things that, especially, you know, in, in today's day and age with the deterioration of the family structure and, you know, the increasing reliance on, on technology to, to act as a parent. I think that that's something that will help a, a wide swath of society. Right. And I see that it could lead to better, what more well-adjusted people. Is there something that's going to replace having a good parent? No, but I do think that it could make up for a lot of the deficits that we currently have in society. And, and I hope that people look at it as a positive thing and, and, and start measuring these outcomes uh, so that they can, they can see that this is better or worse. What I don't want to happen and what I, I honestly really worry about happening is that social media oftentimes is looked at like this great thing, but I looked at it oftentimes as, as a negative effect for society. Um, so, so, you know, what, what do you feel like? I mean, do you feel like it's more of a benefit or a, a negative? My sense and my read of the literature, uh, to the extent that I have is that it seems to be doing more harm than good for more people than not or at least for so many people in so many deleterious ways uh, that I'm genuinely concerned. I have a 14 year old daughter and mm -hmm. uh, she discovered TikTok, uh, and we had to put the clamps on that. Uh, not because TikTok is de facto bad. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll stay out of that debate. I will say that for a young lady in these days and times in America, the constant stream of images and the messages about what her body should look like, mm -hmm. about how she should and should not behave towards her peers, how to be popular, for example, uh, those messages are not anything that that 14-year-old developing mind needs to be exposed to except to know that they are there and that discernment is required, that there are people out there who will try to convince you of their personal opinion, irrespective of your well-being. There are people out there who will try to uh, persuade you to see things the way they do, because ultimately what they want is your credit card number. Yeah, that's true. They're I mean, not necessarily interested there, in there's whatsoever. Definitely, there's definitely a financial incentive for social media. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to a... Uh, software program or robot or what have you mimicking social interaction. Do you feel like that's going to be a positive? I personally feel like it's going to be a positive. I, especially if we can limit the amount of the negative influences of culture on that stuff and keep it objective. If, if this thing is just about making you feel better, especially if we market it as a healthcare tool, just like what you're doing, you know, um, that I think is going to be a positive benefit. If I, I, that's the only antidote that I see to a lot of the negative effects of technology that, that we have is just, just to build up the capacity for human like interactions that are positive without the um, financial incentive component, try to at least make it beneficent. I, beneficence is the key term. And so what you're referring to is exactly what I've been hoping to say, and that is that uh, ethical responsibility, thoughtful consideration about what exactly are you trying to achieve? What are you trying to help people to accomplish, to experience, to rectify if needed? And then how do you thoughtfully go about designing whatever the technology is? to help those people meet those goals, help them meet their goals, and to reduce uh, risk for chronic e disease development. Uh, if you can help address loneliness, then you may help reduce risk for chronic disease development and progression. That's great. Now, be careful. Don't train people to only just sit and interact with your technology without going outside, because that technology will not help them generate vitamin D. 
do not train them to spend so much time with the technology that they fail to call and check in with their friends and to ask, how are they doing? So great, I'm feeling less lonely. Now, how can I be of service to someone else? And and thankfully, there are people, very bright people, who are getting together regularly to talk about and explore these issues and actually to issue guidelines. And of course, we know. The difficulty is people like me who will follow those guidelines and try to play within those boundaries may we may win we may do uh, we we may accomplish great things and there will be others who will not play within those guidelines mm-hmm. so again one of the important things we have to help people to do is to develop discernment to to be good critical consumers and to understand what are the sold effects versus what are the intended effects? Uh, because you can sell me something that I think, okay, well, that's going to help me feel better. Well, no, it's just snake oil. And yeah, your real goal is just get my credit card number, irrespective. So, what are some positive companies out there? Like, one of the things that I, I look forward to is hearing experts best hopes for the future. You know, the the idea, I think one of the things that we had talked about before this podcast is that having like a chatbot direct you to websites where that actually fuel human interaction, like yes. meetup.com, right? Yes. So yes. Like, like I look at, so I look at meetup.com as a positive, right? I do too. It's not quite there. I mean, it's still super awkward. You know, you I, I signed up for a meetup.com when I moved to a new city. And those interactions to me were kind of forced, but it made it pushed me and yeah. it gave me enough social um I guess thickening of my skin where when I did go out to another place where other people were there, I didn't yes. I didn't have the same kind of feeling you know you get used to that awkward interaction then after you get over that then it's like a a better more beneficial so much easier absolutely i i don't have any affiliation with meetup but i have loved that platform for many years and i have recommended it to a number of patients uh, young and old alike because that sort of platform helps you to be aware of opportunities that you otherwise might not have been aware of and probably would not have been aware of and i recommend volunteering so often I recommend volunteer. There's beneficial effects to volunteering, period. I can yeah. cite chapter and verse about that. Yeah. There's also uh, benefits from if you are having trouble meeting other people or connecting with other people or being uh, you're concerned about other, whether or not people will like you. Volunteering is a wonderful path because you're automatically in the same place with other people people who have at least one thing in common with you and you're there to accomplish something that is instrumental in nature. So it sort of takes the pressure off the direct face-to-face interaction. We're here to drive nails and, and schlep buckets and push wheelbarrows to build this house. And we also get to know one another at the same time. And we arrived with something in common. We were both willing to give up our Saturdays yeah. to help someone else have a home and the Habitat yeah. of Humanity being a great example. So I love Meetup and Meetup is a great example, as is uh, Habitat for Humanity. Those are great examples of the sorts of opportunities that I believe good therapists, good friends, good neighbors, and good chatbots can help to introduce people to and encourage them to go and try and then listen to their subsequent experiences of those efforts, and then to use that to help mobilize them to maybe try again, maybe try something a little different, get a little better at understanding their own preferences. So I'll, that was fine, but I really don't enjoy being outside and sweating all day to build somebody else's house. Great. What else might you enjoy? Well, I really love to read. Well, might you enjoy helping someone else learn to read? And yeah. it might be a child. And it might be an adult. How about an, a literacy program for adults so that they can get better jobs? Mm. I can teach adults to read. Yes, you can go learn how to teach adults to read. And the satisfactions that can come from that can be immense. So this as a vehicle to help activate people, show them opportunities they might, might not be aware of, and then encourage them to go and make those efforts and then listen to them with their subsequent experiences to use that iteratively to make better recommendations going forward. Just as as a therapist would, just as a brother would. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like that idea of fulfillment is something that we're all searching for. Like um, 
I'm sure you're probably familiar with logotherapy or logos therapy. I can't remember the exact term. Logo. Yes. Victor, Victor Frankel's, you know, man search, man search for meaning, which who, those of you who are listening, you should definitely read that book. It's really good. Um, I, but, I am a dyed in the wool existentialist many, many years in the making the humanist side of things. So uh, Victor Frankl, Rollo May, uh, the people who are coming from that, uh, Carl Rogers also comes from that tradition as well. I referenced him a little while ago. Those basic human connectivity variables like warmth, genuineness, yeah. empathy, non-defensiveness, curiosity, and making room for the people to tell their own narrative, to tell their own story without passing judgment on them. Yeah, you know, the and I do think that the capacity is there to increase those and specifically the the meaning around those mm -hmm. from te a technological perspective. What I mean is that, you know, in the past, you might only be limited to your local organization to volunteer, like your local Kiwanis or, you know, if you get out of college and you move to a new town, you know, you might at the local food bank. I think it, it's very difficult for you to like enter a national organization, you know, as a surgeon myself, like, you know, I, I can go on an, a mission trip to Zimbabwe now, and that can entirely be facilitated through, uh, through online interactions. And then when I get there, I have this intense experience with those people and those people I become very close to after that. And I think that that's a more significant, valuable, um, uh, uh, friendship and relationship than other relationships that I've had. And that's not something that's just subjective. It's also objective. Mm -hmm. That's something that has been measured in the medical literature, the, the effect of humanitarian missions yes. on the people that uh, participate in them. Yes. That has a profound impact in their just day-to-day -day life, their experience with people, their empathy, but yes. also their social relationships increase. Uh, and and I'm, I'm a living proof of that. You know, I, my, my wife and I met through a, uh, a humanitarian mission for the Syrian refugee crisis in 2015. And so, so I know from the bottom of my heart that there is uh, a profound impact that that can have on your life. Have you had that experience? Is that, can you share us with some of your own experience? Because are, are you a believer? As, are you a, a, a patient as well as uh, the president, you know, when it comes to <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. Now, uh, in fairness, I have to uh, be very transparent. I am fortunate enough to do as a career something I would do as a hobby. I am fortunate enough to be able to do something every day that I would do for free because it is so gratifying. And, th and that is simply helping other people. Um, I also have done volunteer projects and, uh, and volunteer activities. I try to introduce my kids to those opportunities, um, simply helping a neighbor, uh, simply knocking on someone's door and saying, hi, I live right across the street from you. I think we've lived across the street from one another for two, three years. I've never actually had an opportunity to meet you. I live right there. That's my home. My name is Brian. And uh, here's my telephone number. If you need something, call me. Uh, I just want you to know there's someone in the neighborhood that you can call. And why? Because in our neighborhoods, we often are so uh, transient. You know, people buy up and buy down and move so frequently. We often are within physical presence of lots of other people we don't actually know. And so making that effort, doing, you know, avoiding the social loafing of assuming that everybody else will do it or they must have plenty of resources and how pleasant it is for them to say, I'm really glad you came over. You know, I, I, I should have introduced myself long ago. I, I really appreciate that. Um, hey, you know, I've, I've, I've got a lawnmower back here that uh, I was going to sell. But, you know, I, I noticed uh, you have a kid come mow your lawn and he's always pushing it up the sidewalk. Like if you'd rather just have a lawnmower, I'd, I'd be happy to share mine. Hey, you know what? That's really, really great. What can I do for you? Just simple activities like that, like going and introducing yourself to someone and saying, I admit, I've seen you around here for the past six months and I haven't spoken up to say, hi, my name is Brian. What is your name? I live right over there. How about you? Oh, okay. Well, we, we're neighbors. 
it's nice to meet you. I'm glad that we have this opportunity. If you need something, knock on my door. I might not be able to provide it, but I'll try to help you find somebody who can. And people going, wow, I really appreciate that. And, act, you know, their look and, and the tone of their voice is like, gosh, you know, I, I really didn't realize I was missing out on this until you came and offered it to me. But um, and I love to believe that people are paying it forward and going and doing that for someone else as well. Um, I have not gone on a on a mission trip. I have to admit, I just have don't have a lot of time for myself. Meet up. Uh, have you tried meet up at all? Have you done? Yes, that? I have tried. I, I have tried meet up. Um, I I try not to recommend things for my patients or others that I haven't actually tried myself or at least dabbled with. Uh, I, like I said, I've I've loved. I was an early adopter with Meet Up. I remember when they first launched, and I have so frequently recommended that to people, especially who have social anxiety, who are concerned. People with social anxiety want to connect, and yet at the same time, they are afraid to connect. So I use Meet Up as an opportunity to help introduce them to opportunities to be in the same place with other people not just to interact. They're not there to interact. They're there to get something done, but they have the opportunity to interact in the process of doing yeah. that. And it becomes less threatening for them to do it because they're going somewhere where they already have something clearly in common with other people and an instrumental task to try to accomplish, usually yeah. along the lines of volunteer activities or even just kayaking at the local uh, state park. So is that is that what you went for? You went for kayaking? Meetup? Kayaking, yes. Yeah. And so did you have a good experience? Oh yeah, absolutely. And I met yeah. three wonderful people. Yeah. I think doing something out in nature is, is a cool meetup, um, uh, thing. Uh, I hope that we can get technology to help get us over the hump of meeting neighbors. You know, I think that's something that really hasn't come across. Like there's sites like next door and stuff like that, yeah. that initially had that intention but have now become something much different and it's almost like a community bulletin board i feel yes. like it's not really a um that you know next door like it, you you it gives you the ability to meet somebody i hope that the the chatbot will help promote people to do that but you know i i really think that Meetup is is a good example. I feel like LinkedIn is a good example. There's examples out there if people are are looking for them for positive technological experiences that bring us towards a better future. I do, I, and I still think that you know, if we think about ten years ago, again, like I probably would not have access to a lot of like the profound mission trip experiences that I have had without technology. So I think that that trend will continue. Um, but I hope that you know, you see on the horizon, maybe something that I don't, that, that would make that better. Do you see anything coming down the pipeline that would mm. make us uh, more connected as a species, something that interests you? Well, I, I'm foul. I'll admit I'm very fascinated by one uh, particular embodiment of everything that we've been talking about thus far. Uh, again, I don't have any affiliation with the company, but there's a little robot out there called LEQ. And it is designed to help elderly folks to uh, stave off cognitive decline mm -hmm. and be more connected to their families and to have a companion when others are not available. Um, I don't know the folks there. I've just been following their progress for many years. Uh, I wonder, I believe uh, a few years up the road, we're going to look back at uh, that little robot, perhaps that one in particular, as being um, one of those pivotal technologies that help to open up a new field of uh, encapsulating and delivering the beneficence effects of technologies for those who truly have a need <laughs> while doing a good job of ethically avoiding the pitfalls of being commandeered for other purposes. And by the way, of, of the chatbots, I, I will mention there is one out called Wobot, W-O-E-B-O-T. And I happen to know one of the psychologists um, who is an advisor to that program and has been for many years. And she is a beautiful a brilliant and very responsible person. So I know that the input that those developers are getting is high quality input to make that chatbot beneficial and to avoid and perhaps perhaps offset 
some of the negative and deleterious effects that can come through the same sort of channels when it's not being developed and delivered and monitored uh, appropriately or, or in an ethically responsible way. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm very, I, I'd love to see what Wobot and LEQ look like 10 years from now. Before we uh, finish, can I tell you two of the technologies that I'm very interested in? Oh yeah, please. That I think that are really going to help out um, just social connectedness. Number one is early childhood communication uh, robots that develop education specific for making communication better. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like if you have a difficult slope with communication early on, that's going to prevent you from having profound relationships for the rest of your life, right? Like mm -hmm. if, you have, if you're not able to communicate the way that you feel, or if you're not able to communicate with another person and uh, that relationship is not as profound and you feel lonely because of it, I think that that's something that that is a real hindrance for people. And now with all of the technology and research that's going into early developmental education. That's something that I'm really excited about. And I want to hear your thoughts on that one. And then I want to hear your thoughts on translation, because I feel like that is just such a low hanging fruit. And we're so close to that translation, meaning different languages, right? So like my interaction with my in-laws who don't really speak very well English would be something that would be of significant benefit when I can interact with them in real time in a better way than how I'm doing right now. So, so just uh, for the last few minutes, let's just talk a little bit more about those two. Yeah. Let me, let me address that second one first. So in the 1960s, the original Star Trek series introduced the concept of the universal translator, mm -hmm. seamless real time capacity for persons, and I'll use that term generally, of different, entirely different species, to be able to communicate clearly and effectively with one another. And the presumption was, the way that it was presented, the presumption was that it was error-free. I don't know if we're ever going to get to error-free. We, we have enough difficulty when we speak the same uh, first language with one another, miscommunication and misunderstanding. But a translator capacity that is highly accurate, including nuances of language, including uh, idioms that enables real-time communication with people from other cultures and other backgrounds. How can we not benefit from being able to communicate in real time clearly, or at least as clearly as can be expected with people who come from such different backgrounds? How much more can we ourselves be expanded? How much more opportunity for compassion and empathy and assistance to one another is enabled when people with very different linguistic backgrounds are allowed to communicate clearly in real time with one another. That is fascinating, of course, you know, so, so much of Star Trek um, was prescient for so much technology that is being Absolutely. developed sometimes because people saw it on Star Trek and they're yeah. about that, right. You know, I, 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 just a quick aside, like I, that is the, vision of the future that I think is the most optimistic. Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future is so much more utopian than, and utopian and realistic. That is a tangible future, right? Like when we look at other science fictions like Star Wars and things like that, it's just so far off in the distance that I, I don't really know if that's something that like we can relate to, but Star Trek is very relatable. The human interaction with Star Trek is something that I think is really well done you know even with uh with a lot of the interactions between different species it reminds me of different cultures and languages but regardless i think that's a really optimistic vision for the future so for those of you who are listening who are not involved with uh star trek at all you should really give it to <laughs> recruiting trekkies um, yeah, absolutely so, and also the early childhood um so i i love that you're so interested in that uh, there are so many topics there that we could talk about. I'll just pick the one. Helping children to develop emotional literacy. Helping children to develop emotional literacy. Technologies can really assist in that. If you're grazed by people with low emotional literacy, it's very difficult for you to develop it. 
Mm. If you are surrounded by people with low emotional literacy, it's very difficult for you to develop it. But just as I was referencing earlier, emotional literacy, being able to accurately label how we feel and to understand those feelings contextually as they relate to our motives, to our needs, to our goals, to our fears, is emotional intelligence at its very, very core. And the ability then to communicate that in others, to others, and to understand that in others is the emotional intelligence taken to the actual interaction level with others. And so a technology that can help young children learn to identify, label, apprehend, understand contextually their own feelings and therefore their own needs and their desires and their goals and to reconcile when sometimes two goals are in conflict with one another. Sometimes there's two things and you don't want to avoid either or you'd rather avoid both of them, but you can only avoid one. How do you make those choices? How do you introspect with yourself? How do you understand someone else? and what they're really driving at. When someone is angry at you, can you begin to imagine that they're actually afraid behind that anger? And does that help you soften your response to that person? Teaching those skills early and building those foundations early enables children to move forward with more power. More, They are more empowered versus growing up with low emotional literacy, low emotional intelligence, low emotion granularity, and therefore being hampered in their ability to understand themselves and to relate to others. So I'm very excited about your excitement about these technology-enabled capacities for early childhood development. Yeah, I, I, I think that in general, I like the focus that we're having as a society on social connectedness. And I think that's one of the benefits of all the negative with social media is that now like we realize, okay, like this, this is something that has a profound impact on us. Let's focus on it and try to make it better, you know? So not, it's not necessarily a bad thing that we're going through this. It's just growing pains and and something that I really look forward to the, to the, to the future where computing technology and, and, you know, artificial intelligence technology and a lot of these other uh, emerging technologies that are increasing at an exponential rate, how they're going to affect us. Because now that we know that this is something that's important to us, that's where the the end product is going to be. But I feel like we could talk about this for a very long time, but that is our time for today. So thank you, Brian, for joining us. For those of us who are uh, joining for the first time, I hope that you listen to the other podcast episodes. We had talked about a lot of different things and their effect on the future, but if you are interested more in social technology and well, uh, the things that Brian's are doing, we'll check in with him after he's come out with his product and we'll see what the data shows. Thanks again, Brian. Have a good one, okay? Thanks so much. Take good care. We appreciate you taking part in today's episode. Take this chance to reimagine a better future by joining a community of futurists who strive for a remarkable world. Be a part of this growing network and contribute to making the world a more positive place. Visit thefuturistsociety.net and subscribe to the show so you don't miss a drop of hopeful futurism.